Uh, I'd like to start by quoting a friend of mine who works in a product team in a local tech company. Now, I was talking to my friend about their UX research processes, because that's the kind of thing that BAs like to do for fun, and my friend said something that might sound familiar to some of you. I have to join a three-month waiting list to even talk to my UX research team. Now, I don't know how many product teams out there can wait months to find out what customers think of their work, uh, but this team certainly wasn't one of them. And so they went out and they did their own research. They did some discovery interviews and some concept testing. When things were a bit, a bit further along, they did some usability testing. I asked my friend whether the UX research team was involved in that usability testing. By that time, I wasn't even thinking about the UX research team. So if you work in UX research, this is obviously not ideal. But this is actually the best case scenario when your UX research team has a months long turnaround time. In the worst case scenario, the product team just shrugs and delivers their project without ever talking to customers at all. So now I want to share a quote from a different friend. This friend works at a UX research team in a local tech company. The product team came along to one of our six discovery interviews. They got all excited about this customer's problems. They didn't wait for the other interviews, they jumped straight to designing solutions. So again, this kind of uh, problem is probably familiar to some of you. Uh, and if you work in a product team, it should give you pause. Solving customer problems one customer at a time is not an efficient way to build a tech product. Now, both of these less than ideal scenarios are stemming from an organizational model that seems pretty common, and it's what we have at BNZ, a group of product teams who are supported by a centralized UX research team. I started as a BA at BNZ about a year ago. At the time, my team was doing both delivery and discovery, but those activities operated on very different time scales. We had a rapid delivery cycle of two-week iterations, but our discovery work happened on a project-based cadence. We'd start a new project and we'd go out and do some customer interviews, we'd analyze the results and use the analysis to validate our assumptions, and then we'd go away and build our feature. Towards the end of the project, we'd circle back for some usability testing, and then we'd release our feature and move on to the next project. So, as I observed the way that the team was working, I started to notice some differences in the underlying values of the UX research team and the product team. My product team's core principle was short iterations. They wanted access to the right information at the right time so that they could move quickly in their development work. At best, they saw UX research as a worthwhile activity that was the responsibility of other people, and at worst, it was just another dependency of the sort that agile teams and traditional organizations are very used to working around. The UX research team's core principle was deep understanding of customers. They wanted to take the time to develop empathy and understanding, and they wanted to use robust methodologies for their research. They had limited resources, so they took a pragmatic approach, and they conducted as much research as they could within the constraints of the product teams. Now, that's not to say that the product team didn't value good research, or the UX research team didn't value iteration, but the way that they thought about cadence was different. The agile transformation has caused a fundamental shift in the way that product teams think. They instinctively distrust front-loaded processes. UX research as a discipline has come along for the ride with the agile transformation, but that transformation focused on delivery practices. It wasn't for or about UX research, and so there hasn't been that same kind of fundamental change in mindset. The end result was that the team's discovery and delivery cadences were only loosely linked. The team was delivering software in rapid iterative cycles, and at the same time, they were conducting a slower, more sporadic stream of discovery work. The UX research team had worked hard to compress that discovery work to a time frame that met the product team's needs, but the resulting process wasn't moving in a cadence that felt natural to the product team, and nor was it developing the kind of depth that the UX research team valued. It was the classic compromise making everyone unhappy. So I'll give you an example of our research at the time. My team works on our business banking app, and last year we started on a new project, payments. So we needed to figure out how to help businesses to pay their suppliers in online banking. At the start of the project, we interviewed six customers from a range of user segments. We talked to them about their processes and their understanding of payments, and then we conducted our standard analysis exercise. We took the notes and transcripts from our interviews, and we wrote up our observations, 
We grouped those observations into themes, and then we used the themes to develop insights, things that we'd learned about customers and payments. One thing that we were interested in was the relationship between payment roles. So lots of businesses have separate roles for the person who sets up a payment and the person who approves it. We wanted to pull apart the way that these two roles, payment creator and payment authorizer, interacted. And we wanted to find out what needs the authorization process served. And so one of our themes was about responsibility. Division of responsibility is a key governance practice for many businesses. The authorizer checks the payment creator's work to make sure it's legitimate. We found that payment creators were really aware that they were dealing with someone else's money. They felt invested in the checks and balances that authorization provided. Meanwhile, authorizers liked authorization because it gave them a sense of control over how the funds were handled. So under our normal process, we would have stopped there. We'd done some research into how people thought about payments, we'd generated our insights, and we would have moved on to building the solution. But around this time, my team was trying out continuous discovery. Continuous discovery moves discovery into the same cadence as delivery. The team conducts short research activities every iteration. So we talk to at least three customers every sprint. This means that the entire research process fits into two weeks from planning to recruitment, the research itself, and a time box analysis period. Now, that might sound like we've abandoned the compromise between the UX team and the product team, and we've just done what the product team wants. And it is true that we looked at the needs of the product team first. Our core belief is that the product team owns the research, and so our research activities need to be feasible for the team to run by itself. But we don't want to ignore the need for depth. Accepting shallow answers isn't good for the product team either. And so our questions were, how can we create a continuous discovery process that's run by the product team, for the product team? And once that process is in place, how can we enrich it to create depth of understanding? So we modeled our continuous discovery process on the Scrum methodology. Scrum works because its processes are ritualized and standardized. The team is involved in the same rituals every sprint. No one needs to remember to plan the next round of delivery work because every second Monday we go to a sprint planning meeting. And there are standard processes for conducting pieces of work. We always remember to do accessibility testing because it's in our definition of done and it's on our Scrum board for every story. What this means is once the Scrum processes are set up, it doesn't take cognitive effort to keep them going. We fall into a ritualized process that happens the same way every time. For continuous discovery, we take the same approach. We standardize our research practices and we tie them to our scrum rituals. So during that sprint planning meeting, we decide which stories we'll deliver and we also decide which research activities we'll undertake. For each kind of research activity, we have a standard list of tasks to complete. Those go on our scrum board and we discuss them with the team at stand up. So no one needs to remember to upload audio after a customer session, it just happens as part of our regular routine. This means that we can pay less attention to the framework for the research activities and more attention to building quality into the activities themselves. Now, it is still important to be flexible with this process. So some research activities, like creating attitudinal personas, just don't fit within a short cadence. And that's okay, we don't want to set ironclad rules for our process. Instead, we set those activities apart from the usual discovery cadence, and we progress a few at a time over a longer time scale. The key for us is to pull apart our practices and figure out what value they add. Which parts of this process work for us and why? Which parts aren't adding value and could we achieve their intended goals another way? Then we can make conscious decisions about when and how to apply our practices. So now we had a continuous discovery process that was running pretty well. The team was talking to customers every sprint. The overall process seemed doable. It was all going great. There was just one problem, analysis. Everything else fit nicely into our sprint cycle, but analysis was tricky. Under our previous research process, we'd devote a focused period of time to analysis. That's what we'd done at the start of our payments work. We'd taken the observations from our interviews and we'd spent several days theming them and drawing out insights. But my attempts to pare that process down so that it was feasible on a sprint by sprint basis kept failing. There just wasn't enough time to do it all and so our insights seemed shallow, and we weren't covering everything we wanted to. 
And that led me to think about something else that was bothering me about our research practices, the question of whether we can have faith in our own insights. Every time we turn a group of observations into a theme, and every time we use a theme to develop an insight, we're making an abstraction about what they mean. And every time we make an abstraction about meaning, we're introducing bias and assumption and the potential for error. The traditional UX research approach to having faith in our insights is to have a robust research plan, do our best to minimize bias, and use the appropriate analysis techniques. There's an assumption here that if we conduct our research properly and we spend enough time thinking through the results, then our insights will be robust. They'll accurately reflect our customers' experience. They'll shed light on how they really think. We're confident in our insights because we have evidence for them in the form of the observations that we use to create them. We can draw a line from the insight back to the observations that we based it on, and that's what validates it, and that's what we put faith in. But that's a problem for continuous discovery because we don't have time for long-form analysis techniques. If we spent three days on analysis every sprint, we wouldn't have time to do anything else. So how can we create depth of understanding and have faith in our insights within the confines of continuous discovery? So there are two practices that we've found useful to develop depth, explicating our thinking and pushing beyond the surface level of our reasoning. Explicating our thinking means writing down what we think in detail. We need to physically write it down and not just discuss it because it forces us to say exactly what we mean in a way that other team members can then scrutinize. And we need to write down not just our conclusions, but also the chain of reasoning that led to those conclusions so that every step in our logic can be examined. What we found when we started doing this was that we weren't on the same page about what we thought even within the team. We'd been writing our insights down and agreeing on them, but when we tried to explain the reasoning behind them, it suddenly became obvious that different team members had different ideas of what they meant. We could then look at those discrepancies and learn more about where our own assumptions came from. We also have a practice of pushing our thinking deeper. So we were used to looking at a collection of observations and forming a conclusion about what they meant. Something like, customers want X, or customers feel Y. But we weren't always pushing beyond that surface level and asking why customers want those things or why they feel that way. We weren't examining the beliefs and the thought processes that influence customers' behavior. So implementation of this practice is pretty simple. We give someone on the team the role of making sure that we're thinking deeply. Their job is to keep asking why. They encourage us to examine the underlying causes until we've formed a theory of our customers' needs and behavior. What's key here is that this practice of pushing our thinking must be explicit and deliberate. We can't expect ourselves to just do this by default. Our natural inclination is to stay at the surface level. It's just easier than examining our thinking in depth. When we first started the practice of pushing our thinking, we found that it made everyone on the team quite uncomfortable. People would sometimes reach their limit and just leave the meeting room in the middle of the session. That's why it has to be a deliberate practice. If no one consciously focuses on extending the team's thinking, then it's unlikely to happen on its own. So to show you what I mean, let's return to our example about payment authorizers. Our insight about responsibility was that authorizers are responsible for payments and that this reassures payment creators and it gives authorizers a sense of control. But that's a surface level insight. Customers feel X. We aren't asking why authorizers feel accountable or why payment creators don't want the responsibility themselves. So we took our observations and our insights and we used them to develop theories of, of why authorizers feel accountable. What does accountability actually mean in practice? And part of our theory was that, was that accountability means being responsible for the overall process, for making sure the payments go through on time and are accurate. In order to do that, authorizers need to be aware of the overall process and not just of individual payments. So one of our theories was, Authorizers think holistically about the payment process. That theory isn't based on the customer's conscious thoughts, it's based on the mental model that's influencing their behavior. So we had our theory, and here's where we started to see the power of the iterative feedback loop in our research. Because the next sprint, we went out and tested our theory to see if it was accurate. We asked ourselves, what would we expect to see from customers if our theory is true, 
if authorizers think holistically about the payment process? Well, we'd expect them to notice if a payment went missing. We'd expect them to think about the payments workload and make adjustments to correct issues. And we'd expect them to periodically take stock of the payments work to make sure it was running smoothly. So we went out and talked to some authorizers, and as it turns out, our theory was totally wrong. For the most part, authorizers are actually quite reactive in their approach to payments. They deal with work as it comes across their desk, and they don't have an overall picture of how the payments work is going. This was really interesting, so we started to dig deeper into how these roles feel about accountability. And we found that although the authorizer is technically responsible for payments, the person who's actually making them happen is the payment creator. They're the ones with an overall sense of the work, and they're the ones who make sure authorizers do their job at the right time. We spoke to one payment creator who yellow carded her boss if he was late to authorize a payment. And when you talk to them about it, both payment creators and authorizers say that the authorizer is responsible, but both roles also acknowledge that in practice responsibility lies with the payment creator. So we'd learned something new, that one of the foundations of our thinking about payment roles was wrong. And we could now feed that new information back into our analysis. We'd done a short burst of deep thinking that fit within the confines of our sprint. We'd explicated that thinking in a way that could be tested. And we'd use the feedback loop to refine and rework our theories and our insights. We've changed our practices for developing depth. But notice we've also changed something more, something more fundamental. We've shifted the basis for our faith in our insights. Our faith used to rest on the robustness of our research practice. Now it rests on the iterative feedback loop. We're confident in our insights, not because we can draw a line between the observation and the insight it generated, but because we regularly test our insights to see if they hold up. Our previous UX research process was iterative to some extent. If our first research round didn't validate all our assumptions, we'd go out and do another one. But we didn't do that for everything, just for the things that we weren't sure about. We'd decide which insights we were confident in, based on the observations behind them, and we'd set those to one side. Then we'd investigate the insights we felt we didn't have enough evidence for. And because we were doing larger and longer research activities, we didn't have time for more than one or two iterations in a project. With continuous discovery, we have a framework that allows us to test all our insights. And so we are less invested in developing a solid theory the first time round. Instead, we get our theories down on paper quickly and then refine them through continued research. I don't mean to suggest that robustness of practice is unimportant. We still want to minimize bias. We still want to cover different customer segments. We're just not relying on that robust practice to safeguard us from errors in our thinking. So when my team has ended up as a result of implementing continuous discovery as a new set of values for our discovery work. Firstly, we implement our research practices in a way that feels natural to the product team. And that means a short iterative cadence. We don't compromise with a lightweight research process that still operates on that project-based timeframe. Instead, we treat the product team's way of doing things as paramount. We start by building a research practice that suits their iterative mindset. And then we figure out how to develop that practice to achieve robustness and depth. Secondly. We constantly examine our research practices to make sure we're getting value from them. Developing depth in our research is hard. We can so quickly fall into a validation mindset where we assume our thinking is right and we overlook evidence to the contrary. And it's not enough just to do more research. We could talk to customers every day and still not move beyond the surface of our own assumptions. Instead, we need to deliberately challenge our own thinking. We need to assume that our first theories will be wrong. And we need to examine the assumptions that our practices themselves are based on and explore whether those assumptions are valid. By doing this, we can move beyond shallow answers and start to develop the understanding to address our customers' true needs. Thank you. <laughs>